Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll do some data sufficiency problems. That you find that you will find on page number 208. Please turn to it, page 208, beginning with the second column, the very first problem that you see there, number 302. If at the end of the video you, you find that this was helpful, and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire my services as your tutor, you can reach me at Kashwani Prep at iCloud.com. Send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Number one. On the, in the second column, it says, is, is W plus H squared, rather H to the fourth, positive? That's all it is. Let's see what the first, first, first one tells you. It says H is positive. It says H is positive. As you can see here, telling us that H is positive actually is a worthless information. It is worthless because, of course, H to the four here, H to the four, they don't need to tell us whether h is positive or negative. We know it because it's raised to even power, it's either positive or it's equal to zero. If h happens to be zero, it's going to be zero. If h happens to be either positive or negative, this quantity is positive. All we need to worry about is w. In order to figure out what w plus h to the fourth is positive, we just have to figure out what w is positive. If w is positive, then the whole thing is positive. This information is worthless. This information doesn't do anything. A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is worthless. Answer cannot be A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that, oh, there you go. Second statement tells us W is positive. There, there you go. If W is positive, then this is positive. We already know this is positive. The whole thing is positive. The answer is B. Oh, this was too silly. That was just too silly. 303. Next problem. It says A is a three digit integer. A is a three digit integer. And second step it says that B is also a three digit integer. The question is, is the unit digit of A times B greater than 5? That's all it is. In order to figure out the unit digit of A times B, let's see what the tell is actually instead of talking about it. It says unit digit, unit digit of A is equal to 4. The fact that I keep going back and forth between capital letter and small letter should not bother you. Don't make a fuss about it. Unit digit of A is 4. So it's a 3, di it's a three digit three digit integer, some 3 digit integer, first is second digit, and the, and, and the unit digit of A is 4. This is your A. That by itself is not going to tell us whether A times B ends in a particular unit. We need to figure out the unit digit of the product of A and B. We need to know something about B. First statement by itself is not, not enough. A, D, B, C, E. But it's not, a, it's not a worthless information. It is not useless information. It will come in handy if we can somehow figure out something about B. But the answer by first statement by itself is not the answer. So answer cannot be A or D. It has to be either B, C or E. Second statement goes on to tell us that the unit digit, unit digit, of B is equal to 7. There you go. Again, second statement by itself is not enough, but if we put them together, that should do the job. We know now that B ends in a 7. This is our B. That ends in a 7. So if we multiply the two, two together, multiply the two together, four, 4 7s are 8. There you go. The unit digit of their product must end in an 8. We don't know what the unit, we don't know what the integers are. We don't care about what the integers are. All we care about is What's the last digit? What's the unit digit of their product? The answer is, is 8, because one ends in a 7, the other one ends in a 4. 7 4s are 28. 
There you go. Number three or four. So the answer here was C. The answer to this problem was C. Putting the two statements together, putting the two statements together does the job. Three or four. The next one. Three or four says that uh, we have a company K, some company named K. We told that it donated P percent of its profit. We should have said donated. It donates P percent of its profit. It's uh, singular. Uh, it is it's, uh, present tense. It donates P percent of its profit every year. The question is. The question is, did did K donate more than ten thousand dollars last year? Well, as you can clearly see, that in order for us to be able, to, as we can clearly see, that in order for us to be tell whether or not they donated more than $10,000 last year, we need two pieces of information. We first need to figure out what percentage of profit they donate, what percentage of, percentage of their profit they donate, and what their profit was last year. We need to, the question is, did they donate more than $10,000 last year? Well, what was their profit last year? And what's the percentage that they donate? So my guess is that each of these two steps are going to give us one, one piece each. It says two years ago, two years ago, they donated $15,000 on a $3 million profit. But there you go, that should tell us that we can figure out the P now. We can figure out what percentage they donate, because every year they do, say, they do the same percentage. But first statement, by not, first statement by itself is not enough. It's very useful information. We can figure out the P from here, but we don't know what, what, the, what, the, what the profit was last year. So first statement by, not, by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is not enough, as we just said, but it is a very useful information. Perhaps the second statement, perhaps the second statement will tell us what their profits were last year. If we, if we know what their profits were last year, we already can figure out the percentage from here. It's very simple. They donated fifteen thousand dollars on three million. What we want to find out is the donation over the profit. This is what we need to figure out in terms of percentage. But we know they donated fifteen thousand dollars over the profit of three million. I hope. I hope that this is not something you will do in the real exam. This is a waste of time. You shouldn't have to do this. We should have to realize that it can be done. We don't actually do this in the real exam. Do you understand? But since I started it, let's finish it up. So these three zeros are going to go away, and this 15 is going to go into 32 times. So it turns out it's 1 over, as you can see, it's 2 and then 2 zeros, 1 over 200. 1 over 100 would have been 1%, so it's half a percent. They, they, they don't need half a percent, but that was a waste of time. Don't do that in a real exam. Just realize that it can be done. That's what it is. We do have sufficient data. Let's see what the second statement tells us. If second statement tells us what the profit were last year, we are home free. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. It says last year, last year, the profit were two and a half million. There you go. So the answer is C. Putting the two statements together, we can very easily figure out, if we wanted to, how much they donated last year, because first statement tells us First, from the first statement, we can figure out what percentage of the profit they donate. Second statement tells us exactly what the profits were last year. That's all. The answer is C. As far as the exam is concerned, we are done. As far as the exam is concerned, we are done. Now, had it been a multiple choice problem, and if the problem tell you that certain pro company donates a fixed percentage every year, last year, uh, two years ago, they donated, two, two years ago, they donated... Uh, uh, they donated fifteen thousand dollars on three million dollar profit. How much did they donate last year when their profit were two and a half million? We can do it out very easily. It's very simple. Okay, 
to set it up very easily. So on three million, we were told, on three million, we, we were told that they donated fifteen thousand dollars, which implies, which implies that they donated three fifteen thousand dollars on three million profit, on a one million dollar profit, they must donate five thousand dollars, a third of that. But they did not have a one million dollar profit last year. They had two and a half million dollars. So on a two and a half million dollar profit, they must donate. This is in thousands times two and a half. This is going to be in thousands. Five times two and a half. Five times two is ten, and half of five is two and a half. There you go. Ten and two and a half. It looks like they donated uh, twelve and a half thousand dollars. Twelve and a half thousand dollars. It's not. It's not a big deal. Do you understand? Or you can simply figure out half a percent of half a percent of two and a half million. We could have done that too. We could have done that too. Either way is fine. Finding out half a percent of two and a half two and a half million is not that it's not it's not that difficult. Here is two and a half two and a half million. We know we know that one percent one percent is going to be. You just simply take this quantity and drop the two zeros. One percent. You just simply drop the two zeros. That's going to be one percent. If this is one percent, half a percent is going to be half of that. This is twenty-five thousand. There you go. Twelve thousand five hundred. Just like we, just like we found a second ago. Number three o five. The question here is: Is the area of triangle XYZ less than 20? So here is the triangle that is given to us: X, Y, and Z. This triangle is the area of the triangle less than 20. Let's see what they tell us. The first thing it tells us that x squared plus y squared does not equal z squared. What does it tell us? If x, if x squared plus y squared did equal z squared, it would have meant that this triangle is a right angle triangle. So what they're telling here is that x, y, z is not is not a right triangle. That's all. But simply knowing that it's not a right triangle does not enable us to tell. This does not enable us to ascertain whether or not its area is less than 20. First statement is not very helpful. A D B C E. Answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B C or E. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that x plus z, x plus z is less than 13. X plus z is less than 13. So, in order for us to be able to answer whether the area is less than 20, let's find out the maximum that this area can be. The maximum this can be. Okay, stay with me in the story. I need the room, so we're going to have to erase all of this thing. So we know from the first statement that it is not a right angle triangle. But let's just ask ourselves, what would have been, what would have been the area had, be, had it been allowed, had it been allowed to be a right angle triangle? Because that's where the area is going to be maximum. If, if you want area to be maximum, you make it a right angle triangle and you make both of these equal to six and a half. We are told that x plus y in the second statement they tell us is less than 13. It's less than 13. So obviously they cannot be exactly exactly six and a half and six and a half. But when we say six and a half, we are talking, let's put it here. I need to, I'm going to put a word here so that we can use this word. When we say six and a half, even though we know six and a half and six and a half is exactly thirteen, and it has to be less than thirteen, we are right now speaking hap asymptotically. We are speaking asymptotically, and if you don't know what that word means, learn it, improve your vocabulary. Just search for just search just search for GMAT vocabulary words. GMAT vocabulary words. Day seventy eight. A video will pop up. Uh, watch that video, and if it doesn't pop up, type, type in my name with it, Kashwani, and then GMAT vocabulary words day 78. Watch that video and learn it. So what that means is that they are not exactly six and a half. This is 
this is 6.4999999 forever and ever. And again, this is 6.49999 forever and ever. That's what we're talking about here. The, the extreme that we go in the limit. If that's the case, the area of this guy, okay, so here uh, we're making it equal and we're making right angle triangle. In this case, the extreme case, the area is going to be one half base, which is 16 and six and a half. Let's make that right 13 over 2 and 13 over 2. Let's raise this thing so we don't get confused. This, this thing is 6.5. And, and that's the area. 13 times 13 is 169. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. If we divide it, 8, 16 has 2 8s and 9 has 1 8. 9 has 1 8 and after we take away 8 from the 9, we have a remainder of 1. It's 21 and 1 8. 21 and 1 8 is the case when the area is uh, when the triangle is a right angle triangle with the sum of the two sides being 13 because that is the maximum it's the maximum because it is maximum because if you want the maximum area with the given parameter what you do is you make it a square that's a square rectangle will have a smaller a smaller uh, uh, area that's the square here so that's the maximum here and the maximum turns out to be 21 and 1 8 which means which means the area of this thing, 21 and 1 8, I hope you understand, is 21.125, 125, which means that the area of the triangle that is given to area of the triangle that is given to us, which is not a right angle triangle, and is not equal to 13, it's less than 13. I'm going to erase all of this thing, or we can leave it here. It is not, it is not a right angle triangle, but it is quite possible that this angle that you see here is 89.9999 degrees. And this is this is 6.49999. What? You get the idea. This is less than 13. The sum is less than 13. It's not a right angle triangle. In that case, it is quite possible the area of this thing might turn out to be 21.1249999. There you go. Forever anism, which means the area of this thing is 21 and 1 8 asymptotically speaking. You see how this word is used? It's an asymptote. It's in the limit. Which, so is the area of the triangle less than 20? Well here it is more than 20. As you can see it approaches the area of this triangle in theory in theory can approach 21 and 1 8. Let's see what the lowest it can be. Let's see what this is the highest part. Let's see what the lowest it can be. Remember, we are still working on the second statement. It's taking a little bit too long, but, but that's what it is. In the second statement, again, we know that x plus x plus y, we are told, is less than 13. And because, because it does not tell us in the second statement that it is not a right angle triangle, so we could assume it's right angle triangle. And here, here's the extreme. Okay, watch what happens here. Here's the extreme. Here's your triangle. Here's your triangle. And this thing happens to be 12 and... How should, I, how should I write it? 12 and, how about 12 and uh, 0.9999 and this side is going to be 0 0.001 Now when you multiply it, because it is 1 times 1 times base times height, because height is almost 0 height approaches 0, asymptotically speaking height approaches zero because we didn't, we didn't have to stop here. It could have been zero, 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 zero. And this could have been, instead of, instead of 0 0.9999, this could have been uh, 10 million, 10 million minus one over 10 million. You get the idea. It's not exactly 13, it's 13.9999 forever and ever. And why stop at 10 million? Why can't, why don't we go to 100 million or 100 billion or 100 trillion? It's, it approaches 13. This side, asymptotically speaking, this side, asymptotically appro uh, speaking, approaches 13 and this side approaches almost 0. If that were the case, the area of this triangle would be 0. But it will never be 0. It will approach 0. Which tells us, which tells us that the area of this triangle, the area of this triangle that we're talking about, the area of the triangle that was given to us, area of this particular triangle that was given to us, given the fact that x plus y is less than 13, based on that part, we can tell that the area of this triangle has to be obviously more than 0. It can never be 0. 0 would be when a straight line, with one straight line of 13. 
If that's not a triangle, obviously, it has to have some angle. So it's not it's not it's not going to be zero, but it's approaching zero. Area of the triangle has to be more than zero, or less than twenty one and one eighth. That's the second statement. So are we able to answer the question? Is the area of the triangle is the area of the triangle uh, less than twenty? Are we able to answer that question? Well, in one case it can be zero. In the other case, it can be as high as 21 and 18 approaching is. Do you understand? We cannot. Let's put the two together. If you put the two together, if you put the two together, the first statement tells us that it's not a right angle triangle. It is not a right angle triangle because, oh, I left out something. Because in the second statement, we assume that it could be a right angle triangle. Technically, technically what it is, is it is either, if, if it happens to be a right angle triangle, this would be the case, all the way from 0 to less than or equal to 21 and 1 8. Second statement tells us, if we put 1 and 2 together, first and second statement together, first statement tells us it is not a right angle triangle. By telling us that it is not a right angle triangle, all that does is it removes this equality. That's all it does. But we cannot tell whether or not the area of the triangle is less than 20. It could be less than 20 or it could be as high as 21 and 1 8, almost approaching 21 and 1 8. The answer to this problem is E. Boy, we spent a lot of time on this problem. I don't know why. I don't know how it happened. Obviously, in the real exam, we don't have that kind of luxury. But if you understand the concept, if you understand the concept, and if you understand the concept of asymptote, you should, it should not take that long. You should understand the two extreme limits. The two extreme limit is where it is a right angle triangle, in which case you just do six and a half times six and six and a half by six and a half, one half times six, six and six and a half and six and a half, and you realize that, that the maximum area that it can be is twenty one and one eight, and the minimum area of any triangle, any triangle, is when it approaches zero. It cannot be zero, but it approaches zero. That's when you make one side very little, almost close to zero, and make the other side as long as possible. If the sum of the two sides is given, that is. Number 306. Number 306 says that we have points A, B, C, and D. And they lie on a line, we are told. They lie on a line. We are further told that C is the midpoint. C is the midpoint of A, B. We have told also that D is the midpoint of CB. The question is, is DB greater than 5? That's all it is. Is DB greater than 5? Let's see what we can do here. The best thing to do, the best thing to do is just draw out a picture, shall we? Let's draw a line here. Let's put down here A. Uh, A, B, C, and D. There we go. We are told the C, C is the midpoint of A and B. Tell you what, in that case we really don't need a... Oh, I see what I did here. C is the midpoint of, C is the midpoint of A to B. So this is not going to work. Just let me start again. I wasn't reading, I wasn't paying attention, it is what is given to us. Here, let's first draw A to B. A to B. C is the midpoint of A and B. Let's put a C here. Right there is the midpoint. C is the midpoint. And we further told that D is the midpoint of CB. CB, D is the midpoint. Which means this distance here equals that distance over here. And this distance here has to equal this distance here. Let's see what we can do. The question simply is, is, is db greater than, is db greater than 5? Well, one possibility, one possibility is, one possibility is, maybe a, just plug in anything that you want. Maybe a to c is 5 and c to b is 5. In which case d to b would be two and a half. It will be two and a half. In that case, in that case, 
the question, answer the question, is d to b greater than 5? d to b is only 2 and a half. That's one possibility. Is there any other possibility? Of course, there are millions of other possibilities. There are infinite other possibilities because we know nothing about the line at all. There are infinite other possibilities. So if there is a possibility, maybe a to c is not 5, maybe a to c is 50. And c to b is 50. In which case, this will be 10 times 50, uh, 10 times 2 and a half. In other words, d to b in this case will be 25. So in the first case, the answer was no, d to b is not more than 5, it was 2 and a half. Now, d to b is more than 5. First statement does not tell us anything. Oh, I haven't looked at the first statement yet. Oh, we haven't looked at the first statement yet. But anyway, that's the situation here. Let's look at the first statement. Okay. We, we, we analyze it too much for no reason at all. The first statement tells us that a to c, a to c is equal to more than 8. Oh, there we go. a to c is more than 8. Well, the same thing. The same thing. We're going to do the same thing, okay? All of this thing that I did here that was silly because uh, I, I was not paying attention. We, I had not read the first statement yet. But now that we read the first statement, now that we read the first statement, we do the same thing. Okay, watch what happens. So, we are told that a to c is more than 8. a to c is more than 8. Maybe a to c is 9. Maybe a to c is 9. In which case, c to b is also 9. In which case, this is going to be 4 and a half. Because this is 9 and this is 9. a to c, we are told, a to c is more than 8. Well, a to c now is 9. So in that case, in that case, d to b, d to b would be four and a half. And the answer is no. Is d to b more than five? The answer is no. Another possibility is that since a to c, since we are told that a to c is more than eight, instead of nine, maybe a to c is not nine, maybe it is ninety. In which case, instead of four and a half, it's going to be forty-five. d to b is going to be forty-five. As we can clearly see, first statement by itself doesn't do anything. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement is not enough. First statement is not enough. Let's look at second statement. Let's look at second statement. Let's see what it tells us. Second statement tells us the C to D, it tells us the C to D is more than 6. C to D is more than 6. So we can erase all of these numbers. So we can work on it again. So we're done with st statement one. Statement one did not do the job. We're not going to erase it yet because we might need to put them together. We may not. But let's erase the number. Let's erase all the numbers here and look at second statement by itself. Second statement tells us the C to D, C to D is more than six. Well, if C to D is more than six and D is the midpoint of C and B, we are told that D is the midpoint of C to B. And c to d, we are told, is more than 6, and this must also be more than 6. The question was, is the distance d to b more than 5? Of course, it's more than 5, it's actually more than 6. And how do we know that? Because we are told that the other half, c to d, we are told, is more than 6. Second statement by itself, second statement by itself, we don't even have to combine it together, is enough. The answer in this case is b. The answer is b. Second statement by itself is more than enough. Let's look at 307. These problems usually do not go as fast as the multiple choice problems because there's a lot of reasoning here, you see? When you simply have to solve the problem, you solve the problem. Here we have to do a lot of reasoning. The next one is just as bad. It says people are standing in a queue. We are told that A and B are also in the line. I, I should set line here instead of Q. That will be consistent. So people are standing in the line. A and B are also in the same queue. We are told further that B is behind A with with some people 
with some people in between. We have to take our time to write everything properly because we don't we don't want to miss anything. And then we are told that the number of people in front of A in front of A plus the number of people behind B equals exactly 18. The question is how many people how many behind B? That's the question. How many people are standing behind B? So let's draw a little line so that we can understand what's going on. The fact that we are told the fact that we are told the number of people in front of A plus the number of people behind B is 18, that tells us that A is not the first one in the line. There are some people in front of A. So let's put some people in front of A. And here is our A. And then there are some people in between. And there is our B. And there are some people behind. Are you with me? And let's give this, let's give this uh, unknown quantities names. So the number of people that are standing in front of A, these number of people that are standing in front of A, let's just call it X. There are X number of people standing ahead in, in front of A. And the number of people that are standing between A and B, they are standing right in the middle, let's call them M. M stands for the number of people, M stands for the number of people standing between A and B. And the people are standing behind Y, behind B, let's call it Y. Okay, and let's begin the story. Let's begin the story. You have everything obviously. Let's start with this part right here. So what is given to us, we're going to first write down what is given to us and we're going to erase this thing. Number of people, number of people, number of people in front of A, which is X, plus the number of people behind B, which is Y, we are told is equal to 18. This is all, this is all that the problem tells us. This is all that the problem tells us. Let's, let's see what we can do. Let's see what the statement, first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the total, the total is 32. Total is 32. Let's see how many people are total. Okay, this is where we have to pay attention. This is where we have to pay attention. So we have X number of people standing in front of A. A actually has a name. It's Adam, and this is Beth. There are A. There are X number of people standing in front of Adam, and then we have Adam. This. Then we have Adam. This is our Adam. Then we have M number of people standing between Adam and Beth. And then, and then we have Beth. And then we have Y number of people behind Beth. And that equals 32. We are told the total number of people in line is 32. So, X number of people in front of Adam then we have Adam. Then we have M number of people between. I just I just messed it up, did I? There we go. Now instead of Adam and Beth start writing their name, Adam is one person. Beth is of course another person. And this is our equation. Now watch what happens. What's going to happen is, because we already know the sum of X and Y, they tell us what X plus Y is. X plus Y we are told is 18. X plus Y we know is 18. And we can find out what M is, how many people are standing between, between X and Y. But the question is not how many people are standing between X and Y. That's not the question. The question was how many people are standing behind B. Which tells us that the first, which tells us that the first statement by itself is not enough. First statement only enables us to figure out how many people are standing between Adam and Bath, not behind Bath. So the first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. But because it's turning into such an interesting problem, my gut feeling tells me that per, that we will have something in the second statement which enable which will enable us to solve this problem. So let's finish this up. Let's finish up this equation. So we have x plus 1 plus m plus 1 plus y. So x plus y, x plus y plus m 
plus m and then 1 plus 1 equals 32 and x plus y we know is 18 18 plus m plus 2 equals 32 that's 20 so m equals 32 minus 20 which tells us that there are 12 people standing in the middle there are 12 people staying in the middle that that information will come in handy in a second let's look at second statement let's make Let's make a note of it here. So what this told this what this tells us is that m equals 12. That's what this tells us. But it by itself is not enough. Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that there are 20, 23 people. 23 people. Behind a behind A. There are 23 people behind A. Let's see what we can do with it. So let me draw it one more time. I shouldn't have raised that line. I shouldn't have raised that line. So here we go. One. There is there is A. There is B. 23 people are behind A. 23 people behind A means there are M number of people that are be between A and B. B itself, which is Beth and the number of people behind her. All of these people are behind A. How, how many people are behind Adam? Well, the number of people are standing between Adam and Beth, Beth herself, and the number of people standing behind Beth. And all of those are 23. So 23 equals M plus 1 plus Y. M plus 1 plus Y. Well, uh, that's all there is. There is not much we can do with it, actually. There's not much we can do with it. Because I was about, I was, I was looking at this. This tells us the sum. We don't have a sum here. And that's all we can do. Second statement by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough. But, but, what we might find out, the question was, how many people are behind Beth? That's why. That's his why, right here. How many people are behind, behind Beth? This many people. Well, if we can use the information from here, the first statement, if we can use the information from the first statement, which tells us that M is 12, well, there you go, we can figure out the why. Answer is C. Answer is C. Let's finish it up very quickly. In the exam, don't do that, okay? In the exam, we don't, we don't have to do that, what we're about to do. Uh, oh, sorry, M is 12. M is 12 from the first statement. First statement tells us that the M is 12. There you go, 12 plus 1 is 13, which means there are 10 people. There are 10 people standing behind Bath. There you go. Oh yeah, I always admire people who come up with these questions. It's one thing, it's one thing to be able to solve them. It takes an entirely different level of intellect to actually create it. It was, it was beautiful. Uh, if you found this helpful, and if you wish to work with me, if you wish to hire me as your tutor, as I said in the beginning of the video, send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com and we'll see what we can do. Tomorrow, We'll do some multiple choice problems. All right? Bye now.